Five ways that UX overlaps with SEO, with Pedro Diaz. In Search SEO podcast is brought to you by Rank Ranger, the all-in-one SEO platform that helps scale your business through data and analytics. Hey, it's David. UX is a wide umbrella that extends across the digital world, but how does it overlap with SEO? That's what we're going to be discussing today with one of the few ex Google search quality team members currently working in SEO. He holds deep knowledge in Google search. He has solid experience of the search industry across South America and Europe. While at Google, he not only worked in fighting spam across five plus languages, but also in tools development, debugging search, ranking issues, and webmaster outreach. Welcome to the In Search SEO podcast, the head of organic growth at Autovia, Pedro Diaz. Thanks for having me, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for coming on, Pedro. You can find Pedro over at pedrodiaz.net. So that's Pedro, D-I-A-S dot net. So, Pedro, what's more important, UX or SEO? <laughs> that's, a, that's a tricky question. Uh, I mean, if you consider that SEO... Is like would fall into mostly on it on UX. Uh, SEO wouldn't exist with a lot of disciplines from UX. So I'd say UX gave a lot of the cornerstones that SEO sits in. So I'd say UX is more important. Um, but then again, you have to think on people and robots nowadays. So you cannot discard the importance of SEO either. So that that it leaves us at a you know this 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 kind of bifurcation <laughs> that so, you have to make a decision ux is the father seo is the son more or less it's like a, an improvement over ux i would say or something like that <laughs> well today you're sharing five ways that ux overlaps with seo so starting off with number one website architecture and internal linking so yes i mean if if we i mean you let, let's 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 Talk a bit about UX is so we give context to this. Um, UX stands for user experience, and it goes way well beyond the digital world. It's it's about how people experience um, brands or objects or anything. Um, so, like a buyer's journey is part of UX, but in this aspect, we are talking about websites. So the experience that a user has while using a website. So in that aspect. UX taps into one of its child disciplines, which is information architecture, which is um, it's it, it, it's a, it's an area that started back in the 70s or 80s, and uh, information ar- architecture basically looks at humans, and then it decides how we organize things and how we find things within our ecosystem. And website architecture is no different. We are used to looking at certain ways of consuming information. We read from left to right, from top to bottom, and we cannot counteract that, um, except in other you know, languages or cultures. Sure. But yes, in our mainstream culture, uh, that's how we do it. But, so information architecture looks at ways that people organize information, and then how we build a new system based on that, so it doesn't look completely like an alien from what you have ever seen before, and you like uh, somehow you have a level of intuitiveness when you use the system. So information architecture and URL in a website architecture go hand in hand because when you define the home page is the main page of the website and then you have the child categories and then you have the products or subcategories or whatever and you have a search field in, in here and you have a menu, this all is part how information architecture puts things together and there are principles and there are um, um, uh, heuristics on, on how to decide those things. So it all comes from information architecture. Um, yes, we we kind of tweaked some things to appease search engines and to, not to appease, but to make it easier for search engines to look at information and extract it. Uh, but that's from where it comes from, basically. It, it's amazing to hear you say that it started off in the 70s because I, mean, I always think of um, kind of modern 
um, search and um, finding things starting off in the early 90s um, with the advent of the the web and, and the hyperlinks as well. But um, it's, 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 it's obvious that um, there were things going on beforehand as well. Um, number two is friendly URL. So is that, is that something that has only existed since the web? I mean, not really, but again, it's it's something that goes on on usability. For example, I think it was in ninety something. Uh, Jacob Nielsen, which is a one of the you know pioneers on usability, um, wrote uh, an article saying uh, URL is UI, um, which means that URL is user interface. Which means mm-hmm. that when you look at the URL. If, if you understand how it's broken in paths and directories or subfolders or whatever you want to call it, you understand what in, in which context you are going to be landing in. If it's not a very, you know, you know a cryptographic URL that is full of parameters or something like that. So if you make a URL friendly, which is um, broken down in like subcategories and, and you send it like via text message to someone, in, in the old days, like when you would send a text message or URL in the text, not all systems would extract the metadata and would not pull part of the content like, like we, it does nowadays with WhatsApp or this modern chat messages. So you just get the, the raw URL. And mm-hmm. if you are able to read, sometimes people would just read the URL too and they would know immediately where they are going to land. Oh, I'm going to land in the... As, as, I don't know the pottery section of this 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 ceramic store, mm-hmm. um, and you could tell it right away where you're going to land because the URL gives you context. So it's it's part of user interface. So that's where it comes from as well. So and and usability is the area that would take care of this. So when we decide that URLs are going to be friendly, it's it's both for search engines to be able to extract this information from URLs, but it's also for people. We we sometimes read news just by looking at the URL and we know where we are going to land. So I've got two quick questions about URLs. Um, one is in relation to what you're saying. Um, you're saying that many people look at URLs and might make a judgment on whether or not to visit a web page based upon the URL. I would have thought that just SEOs and technical people may look at that and, um, and, and really judge a page according to that before visiting it. Uh, are you saying that a significant percentage of people who aren't technical will also do that? And, and then also just secondly, an additional question at the same time, um, is there an ideal format, uh, including folder structure for URLs? I'm not saying that a lot of people look at that, but uh, I mean, the ones that do uh, probably find it useful. I don't know. Uh, it, we will we definitely are making it easier even for people that are not technically savvy or don't care about SEO to read the URL if it's friendly uh, because you have all the human readable elements in there and you are kind of putting information into a hierarchy that people are able to consume. So either someone is tech savvy or is an SEO or not, or not kind of that, that helps them in some way. Um, and then... I mean, the, the 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 best nomenclature or, or the way to 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 craft it is is always like within the context of your website. Like, are you an, a very niche website that that you know doesn't sell many things? And for example, you just sell you just you are a balloon store and you just sell, sell like balloons, and there's not much that goes on, much much diversification on on the types of products that you sell you probably don't need such a like a complex categorization of products you don't need um, urls with like two or three sub subfolders because you need categories to to have them in um mm-hmm. whereas if you are a, a, a store that sells everything uh you probably have need to have a more complex categorization system so your URLs will become a bit more complex so so, so, so to say so the best way to categorize a URL or to to decide how a URL is going to be uh, presented is based on how wide or narrow your business is uh, and how uh, how much of range of products do you want to sell if you need to kind of split um, uh, a bro- broad range of URLs across a website or not. And the third way that UX overlaps with SEO, alt text. Oh, alt text is an old one. So 
old text come, comes, it's like alternative text. And it's um, the old way is that one of that uh, it comes from an area that web accessibility and it and aware and it's an area that cares about um, making information accessible to everyone universally, which is one of the, you know, it, it's in the uh, it's, it's in the Google's um, statement, mission statement, make uh, information uh, accessible and uh, to, to, to everyone. And um, so web accessibility says that if there's an element that it cannot be consumed um, in more than one way, like we have five senses, like vision, vision audition, uh, smell, and taste, um, and, and, and feel, you know, uh, tact- I don't know how it's tactical. <laughs> sure. <laughs> tact- uh, so um, if you can, the, the more narrow you are in terms of making uh, information accessible, the worse it is. So in this aspect, alt text is an element of web accessibility, which tries to make images available to people that cannot see them because there are many people that like um, vision or have vision problems um, it being it, problems can be permanent or can be temporary. So you can lose vision temporarily, or you can lose vision permanently. Um, and disabilities are, have this this aspect that can that can be temporary or permanent. And all these web accessibility features kind of try to cater for these shortcomings that people have in life. And search engines are just like a, a blind person because they cannot see what's inside an image. And uh, that's arguable nowadays because you can, search engines st- start to have the ability by tapping into, a, if, you know, artificial intelligence or to kind of render an image and see what's what's in it and try to kind of, but in the old days, they would kind of just see like a, a dark, a, a black square and they, they would only be able to tap into uh, the the file name that you'd give to to the image something something dot jpeg jpeg or into the alt text that you would put in the html uh, describing the image so and search search engines try, started using these accessibility features because it helps them extract information from objects on the web that they cannot render or they cannot access information so hence Alt text came from web accessibility, which is also part of user experience. Like um, all good conversations on this uh, podcast series, I want to dive deeper and ask uh, further questions about each individual topic that comes up. But I'm just going to say number four, organized internal linking and breadcrumbs. So again, it's it's something that marries information. And this is where something that Web SEO started to have a hand on itself rather than being something that's pulled in in a row away from one of these areas. So we we took the organization organizational and the hierarchical elements from information architecture, and then we took the part of making information um, usable and kind of something that 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 guides the user and we married these two two things and we uh, which is usability and information architecture and you put together saying oh if we have these topical linkings that are always present when you visit the website it actually helps you you know go through pages or if you have breadcrumbs on a website if a user comes from a search engine and suddenly lands in the middle of your website because not all users enter on the homepage on your website when you are indexed in Google or search engines. Users will be able to localize them or locate themselves uh, immediately where they they are in your website. So this is two areas of um, that SEO tapped into and said, okay, this is something that we can make it uh, work in a way that benefits users and search engines. So this comes from these two areas. Given the smaller screen size, is it still important to have breadcrumbs on the mobile version of a website? I would say it is, especially on on mobile, um, because I mean you have a reduced screen size, and there are elegant ways to have breadcrumbs in there without ha- you having to have like the whole um, path of, of 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 you know location of 
with the where the user is but we are you know the smaller the screen the more um i would say the more overwhelmed you feel with all the information present that is presented in it and if mm. you don't have um, methods that will help you navigate away or escape from that uh, a place that you fell and you you didn't want you didn't mean to go to um or sometimes you just land in an article and you would want quickly to go to the you know to the broader category of that website to see more breadcrumbs are an easy way to help users do this and any uh, on on a web dev, on a web mobile device with a small screen this is even more you know imp important i would say but yes we have to be careful on not you know overcrowding the screen with 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 information in these cases and number 5 page speed and core web vitals so page speed is something that is older it's it's um it's a metric that many seos kind of started to to pay attention back in the day when Google launched the PageSpeed um, tool, and um, it started because mostly you know websites started to want to make money on the winter on the internet, and this comes of like promoting stuff from other websites. So you either like put a widget on your website from that leads to another website, or you put um, banners or or ads or whatever it is, and all of this amounts to you know making pages heavier because if they have more th stuff to load in them um they just become heavier and the internet speeds you know sometimes on mobile they were famous for being slow so google started to be wary of um loading speed so uh, and again this is something that um if 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 information doesn't load it's not accessible to you so again it's a it's a concern of web accessibility um but then uh, since it was like something that um, uh, it's it's merely technical and it, it 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 can be like oh you can make your server respond really quickly and your page loads really fast it doesn't still mean that you get a really good experience because a page can load fast and everything on the page can jump around while you are uh, you know visiting the page so Google came up with another um, metric or factor so you want to call it it's which is core web vitals which is that they they try to address both performance um the immediacy that uh elements are pulled into v v into the viewing field because stuff can load and you, you you will not see it but the importance of being fast is like that you see the information loading on on the page and then is the third one is like making stuff not dance around that much while while elements are loading. Um, so all these 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 things together try is 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 an attempt of Google to say okay, uh, let's try to transform all these technical elements and and try to make them to work together towards something that gives a better experience to users. So all of this is st stuff that comes from again web accessibility, but it it tries to. To, to appease and and build itself into a more user experience kind of um, aspect, so to speak. Let's finish off with the Pareto Pickle. So Pareto says that you can get 80% of your results from 20% of your efforts. What's one SEO activity that you would recommend that provides incredible results for modest levels of effort? Oh boy, that's, that's a tricky one because, I mean, that's going to depend on, you know, what you need the most uh, you might have gone done a good a good job at for example uh, your website architecture uh, or you might have done a good job at improving your page titles um, and and fall short on everything else so i'd say usually what people leave on the table is the ba the seo basics all the seo basics sometimes are left on the table and because we start right away in, in looking into I don't know, core web vitals or, you know, doing complex comp mathematical formulas to discover the best internal linking and we, fo fo and we forget the rest of the basics. So one of the things that I see that sometimes and my go-to scenario when I start working at any company is look at the, uh, the, the basics, you know, the architecture, the on-page elements, the the hierarchical elements and and all of this together is it in good state is it in good conditions if not then i'm gonna 
reserve some time to work on those before we go into more advanced fields. So I'd say get your basics right. If you get your basics right, be it on like on page or internal linking or website uh, page titles or something like that, which is like something that sometimes is really easy to, to, to look at, you will get a lot of a stronger foundation for your upcoming work. Great common sense thoughts. Well, I've been your host, David Bain. You can find Pedro over at pedrodash.net. Pedro, thanks so much for being on the In Search SEO podcast. Thanks for having me, David. It was a pleasure. And thank you for listening. Check out all the previous episodes and sign up for a free trial of the Rank Ranger platform over at rankranger.com. <laughs>